Welcome to Make the Grade with the success doctor, Stephen Green, where you'll discover actionable strategies to help your student to reach their academic goals, to excel at standardized testing, and to plan for the college admissions process painlessly. And now, here's your host, Dr. Stephen Green. Welcome back, everyone. Steve Green, the success doctor here on the Make the Grade podcast. And as we often do, today's a special day. We have a guest in the studio today, or at least the virtual studio. Welcome, Jesse Kohler. Thank you, Steve G., success doctor. We, uh, today we're going to talk about an important topic. It's very near and dear to Jesse's situation uh, in terms of his life and what he takes time doing. And I'll let him explain that to you. But as always, this podcast is focused on helping parents, helping students, helping families uh, with actions that they can do to maximize and improve their education. So just as a way of introduction, Jesse, tell us about yourself. What are you up to? What are you doing? And then we'll get right into this project you've become very involved in. Yeah. So thank you for having me, Steve G. Uh, Steve was actually my tutor when I was in high school. We've been friends for a long time now. Babysat his kids. We now watch Eagles games together very passionately. Yes. Um, A professional and social relationship. Exactly. Um, So professionally for me right now, I'm the director of development at North Light Community Center. Um, which is a nonprofit organization in Philadelphia. I am in charge of uh, all fundraising, grant writing, those matters. I've also developed a few programs. Um, I I got into that actually after my master's program in educational leadership. Um, And during that program, um, I was actually an intern with the Pennsylvania Office of Attorney General, specifically in the Office of Public Engagement, primarily working on what is now called the Pennsylvania Trauma-Informed Network, or PATIN. Okay. Um, and in researching and getting involved in that space, I got very invested in what is called trauma-informed care. Uh, I have since continued education. I have gotten certification as a trauma-competent professional uh, from a place called Lakeside Global Institute. Um and I am now a board member and the fundraising chair for the Campaign for Trauma-Informed Policy and Practice, or CTIP. Um, I am excited to let you know, and Steve G., I think that this is live on the air. Uh, I have actually just uh, accepted a job down in Washington um, where I will be working for an organization in advocacy and policy called Council for a Strong America. Wow. Uh, But we can discuss all that later. This is breaking news. Breaking news. Greg, you heard it here first. You heard it here first. (laughs) Well, let's uh, let's wrap this around a little bit because there is a lot of ground to cover here, right? Absolutely. Um, So this is obviously a personal interest to you um, to help other people. But uh, who... It, what, what does this group do? Who would be a um, who would benefit from it, uh, or, or who would utilize it, its services? So let, let's drill that down very quickly. Yeah. So CTIP is a national organization. I think that everybody can benefit from trauma informed um, programs and practices. Uh, you know, it, it's not really trauma in. It, it can be trauma in the sense of how many people look at it as extreme violence. You can look at the Adverse Childhood Experiences Study or the ACEs study Mm -hmm. and look at the forms of abuse, neglect, and dysfunction that exist that can be potentially traumatic for people. But we can also redefine what trauma means in this sense as overwhelming stress, or I'm sorry, toxic stress and overwhelming adversity, which at some point in our lives, such as with the coronavirus right now for many people, we experience, we come and go. And just having an idea and an understanding of how brain science works, Hmm. especially in a developing child, being sensitive and understanding of their lived experiences, and as they gain an understanding of the world around them, it can help them cope with stress, ultimately recover quicker, 
We can teach regulation skills, which helps build resilience and grit and can get them back on track quicker when adversity hits, which can be at any time in life. So to be clear, uh, trauma is, is a broad definition. Yeah. And uh, I, it, it, it can, I guess, can mean different things. So this is not necessarily some far end, you know, super, super life devastating thing. This could be mild or or something right. um, is, is it, it certainly can be right, but, but it can benefit people on any end of the spectrum. So, so, so just to bring it a little bit closer home to my listening audience, I, I often see students who struggle in school because their home life is unstable or, or I, I don't know. I don't know. I don't want to use the word trauma clinic clinically, but often I see in a post divorce situation. Okay. Mm-hmm. So you have a family unit, uh, for whatever reason, the, the parents opt to get divorced. This maybe on the surface all looks good, but under, underneath it, the kids are upset, uh, understandably. Um, and, and I've seen this impact their academics. I've seen it impact their social life. I've seen it impact their self-esteem. Um, sometimes it gets better when the parents sort of resettle and get remarry or get into other mm-hmm. relationships. Sometimes it actually gets worse. Um, is there a, a, a um, diagnostic piece to what you're doing, or is this after somebody has already identified that they have a, a, a need? So we CTIPS board has a number of clinical doctors and psychologists who have created diagnostic tools. Uh, right. I am certainly not equipped to diagnose anybody. Um, you know, I, I think that the one thing, again, you know, you, you bring up the divorce situation. And I mean, what this is one like, example, but yeah. just as one example, right? I mean, um, I'll, I'll get back to another potential example um, in a second, but you know, one of the key crucial pieces to trauma informed movement is understanding the attachment relationships and the psychology around attachment. That when you break apart the family structure, that can really impact a child. And again, the younger that a child is the more likely it is to impact them on a very deep level because how their brain is developing. Yeah, I could, I could see that. And, and so it's just an up, it's, it's really an appreciation and an understanding for how these life circumstances, not to say that parents who get divorced are bad. No, 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 it's not judging. They're different situations. No, this no isn't judging. judging. This is just, a, I think a common scenario where maybe people wouldn't associate it with the word trauma. Correct. But it's, but, but it is traumatic. Uh, so the biggest thing to understand is that we have to not, as adults, it can be difficult to put ourselves in the shoes of the child. Mm-hmm. But it's important to remember that trauma or adversity, it, we can't project that onto somebody, right? It, no. it's, it's not an outward experience. It's how we inwardly experience the world around us. And usually it comes when we have something happen where our external and internal resources are depleted and that situation still has not been resolved. A divorce, for instance, a child can try their best to make the parents get along and they aren't able to. Mm -hmm. That psychologically and internally can do something to the child. And rather when a child acts out, rather than getting angry with them, Right. We as adults can come to them with, with a situation and from a position of understanding. And as Dr. Bruce Perry discusses, mm-hmm. there's a three-step process where a lot of times adults go straight to reasoning and trying to use logic with a child who is dysregulated. That isn't going to As work opposed to letting them grieve and, and frustration and, and you know, whatever the, the steps are. Right. And, and it's a process, right? But in dealing with children or relating to children, the, the key three-step principle is to regulate, make sure that the child, if someone's upset, if someone's literally breathing out of control, we have to come to a regulation. We have to go through breathing exercises. There's various ways to regulate. So, so it's a short-term, short-term almost a Correct. triage. So, and then, and then once we regulate, then we can relate to that child. We can come to a place where that child can relate to us. We can tell them a personal anecdote. We can just, 
you know, let them know that we understand where they are. And then we can get to that point of reasoning. It's called the three R's, regulate, relate, and then reason. And it's a much better avenue for adults to go down rather than just trying to dump logic into a child's mind who is dysregulated and is frankly not in their cortex. When we get to dysregulated states, we actually, Bruce Perry's come up with a brain map where he's shown that we actually go down in our brain structure down toward the midbrain which isn't logically thinking, right? It's very reactionary. That's our reactionary mind. It keeps us alive in fight or flight situations. So, so there's so there's actually a neurophysiological change. Yeah, it, that, that you know, there's multiple be, brain states. Right. There, so if we go down, it goes from midbrain, and then we come up more to the limbic system, and then as we go up to our cortex, that's our cognitive thinking. That's the creative mm -hmm. part of the brain. But we need to be in a calm state to actually get there. So when we're dysregulated, when we're trying to reason with a child or use logic with a child who's dysregulated, it's just not connected. And so, so that's why understanding the regulate, relate, and then reason is a better avenue. And it also just helps to just connect with the child, which is critical. Relationships are so critical in terms of helping kids or adults heal from adversity, stress, trauma, whatever you want to call it. When we're in a place where we're not calm, we need those healing relationships to help us recover. So we got the three R's. What is um, in your particular role with this group? So I am in charge of uh, fundraising. I am yeah. the I'm the fundraising chair. I'm part of the executive committee on the board. Um, additionally, we just launched the national trauma campaign, uh, where we are so. In short, the goal of the National Trauma Campaign is ultimately to create comprehensive trauma-informed federal legislation. We are doing that by organizing local liaisons and organizations in all 435 House districts around the country to correspond with their House members and their senators okay. about so the first goal is to have them join the House Trauma-Informed Care Caucus, which already exists. We're really doing an education campaign. Anybody can join this. You can go to CTIP, which is ctipp.org. There is a national trauma campaign button. And in that, on the third section, it's called constituent engagement. And there's actually an application for volunteer liaisons or organizations to sign up and advocate with their representatives and senators. And we, as the national core team, correspond with our liaisons who then communicate those messages or calls to action with their representatives and senators or Congress people, I can just call them. So um, on, a, on a kind of boots on the ground level, mm -hmm. the, ultimately, so there's an organizational level, which may hopefully sooner than later from your perspective, make some sort of federal definition, like what is trauma? which maybe right. leads to like a health, because everything's intertwined, healthcare, insurance, blah, blah, blah. Um, for, on an individual basis, if I'm an adult or, or a child, and I, I think my child has had a traumatic, in, in the context of how you're using it, experience, um, what would they do? Do they come to a, a group? Or do they, is it a resource? Is it kind of a clearinghouse? So there are certainly resources that are available, um, and there's other resources as well. Uh, if you're dealing with children in particular, I can tell you that there is a website called ACES Connection, um, and some of, we have a board member on CTIP who is a higher up on ACES Connection, um, and they have a lot of resources as well. Um, there's another place called uh, Child Trauma Academy, which is Bruce Perry's website. Um, who is who? Cre who created the regulate, relate, and reason? The three R's. Um, there, there's a lot of resources out there. Um, there's no one way to deal with trauma and adversity. So you know, it's hard to prescribe uh, to prescribe parents with how to deal with trauma. There are certainly bad ways to deal with it. Right, punishing the child, getting angry at the child. That's not how we want to deal with that. That's going to create resentment potentially some social and behavioral consequences um, beyond how it's how the trauma is impacting the child up front. 
So you don't um, you don't want the recognition of it and how it's being dealt with to actually exacerbate the situation by right. creating a more traumatized child because of the way an adult unknowingly possibly would be reacting to the behavior. So the, the big the biggest right. part of the trauma informed movement, and we can get into education in a second because there there are a number of schools that have become trauma informed. And the outcome of those is pretty remarkable. Um, but what do you mean really, by outcome, you know, so uh, th there's a number of different outcomes, like the success and stories, kind of thing, or? Uh, expulsions and suspensions go down a lot. Teacher turnover actually reduces significantly, which in the inner city, especially, is a massive issue. Um, imagine, yes. Under resourced schools struggle to keep teachers and developing these environments of understanding is critical to promote better outcomes. Um, if, if, I, well, go ahead. Go ahead. I have a question. No, no, I, I was just going to say, you know, I, I think that it, it's, it's important to understand how when a child is in this dysregulated state, though it can be a short term issue, if it is not handled in an appropriate way, short-term adversity can turn into perpetually downward cycles, right? Perpetual cycles that lead to worse and worse behavior. Um, what could have been dealt with and was microcosmic at a certain point can over time get out of hand if it isn't handled in, a right, in, in the proper way at the beginning. It's really preventative. Um, yeah. Well, in or, in or in kind of early, early diagnosis. Um, again, diagnosis is a relative term. But so uh, here's a question. If I'm a parent and I'm listening to this, and, and th we're not suggesting medical diagnosis here, but mm -hmm. what might be some, um, uh, uh, I, I'm trying to not use medical terminology, but for lack of a better term in context, symptoms or observations that a parent or, or, or a, a teacher, yeah, a professional might, or even a coach, like maybe I'm a baseball coach, right? And I see, you know, kid grounds out and, and has a temper tantrum, right? That's not quote unquote normal. I mean, we get it. They're upset. They made an out. It's not what Correct. they wanted. But if the reaction is so extreme that it's really off the grid of normal, but is there any, is there any quick uh, ideas that maybe a, an adult, could have that would make an observation of maybe that would maybe check like, Hey, we need to take this to another level or take this to somebody who is correctly uh, trained to handle it. Yeah. So, you know, that that's a really tough question, a very good question. I mean, it would seem like that's one of the missions of this group, right? Is yeah. To, to create an awareness of this. So one of the issues is that the way that trauma is going to impact a child is so dependent on the character the the individual nature of that child. I mean, a similar traumatic incident can literally impact one child by causing them to dysregulate. You can see children zone out. Um, okay. Oftentimes we'll call kids, you know, when I was a camp counselor, there were a number of kids that were quote unquote space cadets, <laughs> which doesn't mean that they were all traumatized. But when you see a kid zone out and be that uh, disoriented from reality, that could potentially be a symptom of trauma. So that's one possible. At the uh, same time, okay. a similar uh, traumatic or potentially traumatic incident can impact another child by causing them to become hypervigilant, overaggressive. You get that kid who grounds out, throws his helmet, starts yelling and cursing all over the place, right. gets, into, gets into more fights. Um, you know, it, it kind of spans the entire spectrum from dysregulate or um, you know, just zoning out to becoming hyper vigilant, and it, it's it's very difficult to say. You know, this is what you need to look for. What what can help to look for are extreme changes in behavior, attitude. Um, you can see kids regress in abilities. Oftentimes, and I, I shouldn't even say oftentimes because. Sometimes you may even see them regress in age, like out or, you know, milestones almost, you know, you might see kids start wetting the bed. You may see them starting to need to sleep with their parents again, even though they're, they're like an 11 year old behaving like a four year old. 
you may see that sort right. of regression where that can imply that potentially something has happened. Again, not an automatic. There's no absolutes in this world, but that sort of extreme behavior change may indicate that something has happened. So I, it would seem to me, I mean, there's some things that are obviously traumatic. You know, if a, a, a person close to you dies or if uh, a pet dies or uh, I, I don't know. But I think there's also things, you know, because I had a, uh, I interviewed a person last summer who was an expert on bullying, cyberbullying, right? Um, which has certainly gotten a lot more in the forefront because for a while that was kind of pushed in the bad. Kids are being kids and that's, you know, everybody did when we were growing up and um, not that I agree with that, but there was a little bit of that mindset and maybe mm-hmm. still is, but um, it's, I think even things like that, pe- things that people sort of brush aside, like, Oh yeah, everybody gets made a fun of, uh, you know, you, you don't know how people are going to react to that. And I think your point, you could have 20 people, um, uh, that are exposed to the same uh, stimulus could react 20 different ways. Maybe some, you know, are super, super sensitive. Some are not at all. Yep. Um, is there any sort of uh, statistic of what percent of people are impacted or, or how common yeah. this is in, in So there was a study done in the late 90s called the Adverse Childhood Experiences Study, which really was one of the things that launched uh, the trauma-informed movement. Not the only thing, but it it has helped to quantify some of the impacts Mm -hmm. of trauma. Okay. So Adverse Childhood Experiences, so the study was done in collaboration between the CDC, the Centers of Disease Control and Prevention, Right. And Kaiser Permanente, which is a massive uh, HMO out in California. The 10, they looked at over 17,000 people. It was a longitudinal study. So it was done over time and with a large enough audience that it came to some conclusive evidence. There was, there were these 10 categories of adverse childhood experiences or ACEs that were measured. It was sexual abuse, um, emotional abuse, physical abuse, emotional neglect, physical neglect. And then, so those are the five forms of abuse and neglect. um, And these are all triggers, potential triggers. So that those five are ACEs. And then there were five forms of household dysfunction. uh, A parent was incarcerated, I believe was one. Um, separated parents or loss of a parent, um, depression in the household, substance abuse in the household. Um, So there were these 10 ACEs. Hmm. And it was found that two thirds of the population, and again, this is a a survey of 17,000 people, so it's not an absolute, but but it's a pretty good indication. It's a large enough sample size. Two thirds of the population had at least one ACE. Out of the 10. Out of the ten, it's twelve point five percent. One in eight participants had four or more of these aces. When you have an ace, it was found that there is a graded correlation between that adverse childhood experience and negative behavioral and social and health outcomes. To the extent that, um, you know, I can tell you when someone has four or more aces, they're over the reason that it was very impactful when I was at the attorney general's office is that um, you were more than 1000% more likely to partake in intravenous drug usage over 700% more likely to become an alcoholic. Um, It correlates with cancer and heart disease. Mm. uh, And not just because you're more likely to smoke. It's actually because the stress hormone cortisol has adverse impacts on our bodies when, you know, in, in the short term, if, if we're being chased by a bear, we are going to have a cortisol increase to help us escape uh, that so attack. Flight or fright, fright, or flight attack. and fright, right. Got it. The problem that's with a survival the bear, mechanism at that point. Correct. In the short term, it is a survival mechanism. The problem is, is that when these stressors are long-term inescapable, that cortisol drip stays on and it's no longer a survival mechanism. It actually, in the long run, can 
harm yeah. our lives, if not shorten our lives. So, um, wow. So here's where, here's where I see this is there, there's at least 10 uh, documented stimuli, right? Yeah. And the one thing to say, sorry to interrupt. Go ahead. My ACE score is zero. But Steve, you know this because you were tutoring me at the time that it happened. Right. My best friend died in a plane crash. Yep. And that's not an ACE, but it's still traumatic, right? And so it's important to note that these aren't the only forms of trauma that exist. It was well, just sure. to be able to quantify and scientifically right. show how they impact us. But So, uh, so to kind of, and by the way, Steve Green here on the Make the Great podcast, I am talking with Jesse Kohler. Um. It, it, I think this is what we've, we've, I mean, we've covered a lot of ground in a short time, but uh, to summarize a little bit, there, there's a, a laundry list of potential stimuli, some research, some not, uh, which creates a biochemical or a neurophysical change in, in somebody's anatomy. Uh, in the short term, maybe this is adaptable or, or dealt withable, uh, but over the long haul, there's, there's a, a there's all sorts of issues that can come out of this behaviorally, uh, physically, physically, mm -hmm. emotionally, and so on and so on. And your mission, as long as I'm getting your wording properly, is partly educational. We want to educate the public that this is an issue, period. Uh, secondly, that there are resources, at least some, maybe not mm -hmm. enough. There never is enough, right? Um, that people can go to. And, and your personal mission at this point, at least, is partly to centralize this, make it a kind of an official thing, government or legislatively. Um, where, would, where, would, uh, where, where do you think this is going to be, let's say, in a year or maybe five years? Because is, is, it, it seems like this movement is, what, 20 years old, plus or minus? Uh, since the adverse childhood experiences, I mean, you could say that it's been going on longer than that, but that was really a launching point. Right, so get... comparatively speaking, this is kind of, uh, not. We could call old. it relatively new. Right, yeah. Right. So, uh, you know, in 20 years, they've come a long way, right? Um, mm -hmm. wh what would you say? I'm going to ask you a two part question. One is what's the biggest challenge going on right now? And number two is where do you think where in a, in the best case scenario, where is this in two or three years? So I think that, you know, to answer the first part of your question, and, and you already touched on it, the biggest thing is awareness. Um, yes, and, that's, and what, that's what I was thinking. Awareness you were saying, of okay. trauma as a problem, um, the awareness of how trauma and adversity can impact more of the problems that we are trying to deal with socially, um, you know, youth delinquency, uh, drug abuse, uh, poor parenting, you know, the there are so many ways that trauma impacts so many different sectors and scopes throughout society that if we can bring greater awareness to that, we would be better off. Um, I think that the best place that we could be in three to five years, there's mm -hmm. already a lot of great work that's being done locally. Um, CTIP and if some other organizations as well are trying to sort of connect these dots nationally. Um, yeah. if not globally. And I think that when we can bring out the, the best place that this would be in three to five years is that legislation starts to be passed to create trauma-informed programs and practices. And not just, you know, in Pennsylvania, there was a trauma-informed education bill that was passed in 2019. It was called Act 18. And it was a lot of it was a lot of nice words, but the biggest problem with it is that there were zero appropriations or dollars put toward the programs. Uh, <laughs> I've been in education my whole life. I, I it's get wordly, that. right? I mean, it sounds yeah. great, but, and this happens a lot in, in government is that people are trying to get reelected. They put nice words to things, but if we don't put money to support the programs that can actually impact mm -hmm. what we're talking about, it's, it's not much more than words. Um, but at least it's a start. I mean, to stay, to be positive. It's definitely a start, right? It, it, it's that awareness building. It's the first step. But what really needs to happen to begin to create the resources that you're looking for to direct parents toward mm -hmm. is that there needs to be money put toward more psychologists. You know, right now there is there, we are finding fewer and fewer people going into psychology as a profession because medically speaking, it's one of the least um, lucrative fields to go into. 
And so you have fewer, and, and the cost of medical school is rising. I mean, there are fewer people going into these avenues and instead going toward others or not going into medicine at all. Um, we can, and you know, there's also social workers and there's, there's many, many people that can help and support people and create the resources that are necessary over time. Um, but we need to put more money, more intention behind creating those resources and not just, you know, in three to five years, I think that to answer your question, sorry for kind of bouncing around here. No, it's okay. I think that in three to five years, if we can start to put money or in less time, put money toward the programs that have already proved valuable, proven valuable, such as trauma-informed schools. There was one school that saw a 98% reduction in suspensions and expulsions, which is ultimately going to save schools money over time because schools have to pay for students that they expel. They have to pay for their alternate placement, right? That is taxpayer money that is being spent every time that a student is expelled. If we can reduce the number of expulsions by increasing awareness around issues and how children are reacting and find better ways to mitigate those reactions, mm -hmm. increase regulation and regulation within those students and keep them in those schools, that will save money. That saved money, we can then reinvest in more programs. And Which more then the whole thing spirals in a positive way. I think that that is what can happen in a short amount of time to sort of propel this movement forward as time moves on. Well, let, let's do this here. We are uh, up against our time limit for better or worse, but I think this is a, first of all, extremely important subject. Uh, I think th there's certainly room for way more discussion here. So <clears throat> if you are available, maybe we bring you back for part two of the uh, Jesse and Steve show here, but um, let, let's do this. Can, can you give me like a, uh, maybe like a one or two sentence summary of what your mission is. And by the way, uh, you know, I'm going to have all of these websites and all the acronyms that you throw out there in the show notes. Um, but, you know, so let's, in, in summary, so we're talking about trauma awareness, right? So let's kind of wrap it up. Give us a wrap up here. Yeah. So, you know, I mean, I, I can tell you that CTIP's mission is to create a resilient trauma-informed society where all individuals, families, and communities have the opportunity and support needed to thrive. Okay. I, I think great. that what we're really getting to is building resilience, building grit to overcome adversity, as well as deal with traumas that have happened in the past and move our society to a place where it can regulate and it has the ability to overcome these obstacles that we're going to face also with climate change, with the coronavirus, with anything that comes up, we can build community, we can build these soft skills that help us overcome and remain in some sense of normalcy mm -hmm. as time moves on that can help us continue to move forward. So this is in a way the classic teach them to fish, not give them a fish. I would say so. I mean, broad, very broad because there's so many levels and so many layers uh, to peel back. Well, Jesse, thank you so much for your time today. I, I'd like to, you know, set up another time and we can, uh, you know, go to another level with this. But uh, again, Steve Green here to make the grade podcast. Uh, my mission is to provide parents and students and people in the education space with actions and information they can use right away to help maximize their education. Jesse, thank you again. Thank and, you, Steve. Uh, Let's set up a time soon to do this again. Yeah, we will. We will get it back. So uh, thank you, everyone. And we'll see you next time. You've been listening to Make the Grade with the success doctor, Stephen Green. If you enjoyed this episode, be sure to subscribe. For more resources and support, please visit makethegrade.net.